as we head into 2020, there are at least three Republicans challenging President Trump for the nomination. During Politicon, I sat down with the former South Carolina governor, Mark Sanford. We discussed why he believes he should be the nominee. We also talked about his plans to finish President Trump's border wall. Let's take a listen. Governor Sanford, thank you so much for joining me. We really appreciate it. Pleasure. Absolutely. So, sir, I think the central question around your candidacy is why are you running for president? I'm running because I think we're walking our way toward the most predictable financial crisis in the history of our nation. Mm -hmm. And yet, remarkably, we're having zero conversation in this presidential cycle about the debt and the deficit in government spending. Uh, I'm running as well because I think we need to have a, a real conversation as Republicans about what it means to be a Republican. Um, it used to mean engagement with the rest of the world as opposed to looking inward. That has am uh, ramifications on trade and tariffs. I think we need to have a conversation about the sanctity of the institutional framework of government that our founding fathers gave us. They're really the glue that hold our balance of power in place, and I think they've been challenged with this administration. And finally, I'm running because I think we need to have a conversation about tone. I think the president's off on tone. And I saw it in my congressional district that I used to represent. Yes. It went Democratic for the first time in 50 years, in large measure based solely on tone. You had working moms, soccer moms, young millennials who turned away in droves who said, what's going on here is inconsistent with what I've tried to teach my kids or what my parents have tried to teach me. I'm out. So, and so I, I think that, you know, there are four sort of main thrusts of my campaign. That would be it. So the question is, is, you know, you had your launch camp, your launch in Philadelphia, only one person showed up. So the enthusiasm for that doesn't really seem to be materializing on the ground. How are you grappling with that? Well, nothing yeah. against press world, sure. but that's an urban legend because okay. that wasn't the case. It was, I hate to use Trump's word given the fact that I'm an opponent, yeah. but completely fake news. Huh. Well, uh, yeah. And so if you actually, you could mm. Google it, you will find that I launched my campaign on Fox News about mm -hmm. a month before. Right. We did a, a kids were bankrupt and we didn't even know it tour where we got in a suburban in Philadelphia and we drove to LA, we started Independence Hall, we mm. ended at uh, the Reagan Library. And we purposely did not invite people because there's no way we could cover the geography that we needed to cover. Mm and make three media stops a day, which we did each of the different days as we went west. So, hate to say fake news, but that one uh, was. Well, yeah. so you were <laughs> yeah. certainly a victim of it because yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. I saw it circulated online. Sure. I, I think the real question here is, what lessons do you take away from the 2016 campaign? Because I've watched, you know, you basically have an election. GOP voters reject this ideology in favor of protectionism and less immigration. Mm -hmm. And yet you're still out here talking about the debt. This is very much a Tea Party message, which was repudiated in the 2012 election, and particularly in the 2016 election. Why is it the time for that now? Uh, one, yeah. there's always a straw that breaks the camel's back. And guess what? We're mm -hmm. here. We can go into a longer and more complex conversation on numbers, but that's the short version. The other is, it wasn't a repudiation of those things. Mm -hmm. It was a, a, a was lie yeah. from the president. What he said was, if you elect me, I will eliminate the debt over the eight years that I might be in yeah, office. Yeah, but nobody voted for Donald Trump because of the debt. Oh, no, no I agree no, with you. No, not a single person. No, 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 but, but yeah. the, the things that he said resounded with voters. Yeah. Uh, that was, again, uh, uh, in the quiver of different promises that he made that he's since walked on. So yeah. I think that the Tea Party, if you want to call it that, that voter, either the conversations I had with the, the voters over the last 25 years of politics in Congress and in the governorship, either those conversations were real and the pocketbook issues that people would uh, express real dismay on as they sat around the kitchen counter as they, you were in a, a small business setting, either those conversations were real and those concerns are still there, or all those folks have been sent off to Mars or they've had frontal lobotomies. Mm -hmm. It's one of the two. And so I think that, it, in other words, did the Trump talk cultural issues? Yes. Was that top and center? Yes. But did he also say yes to the, the bread and butter issues that, that at least in large part the conservative movement has always been about? He, he did that too. Yeah. And, and so I think this is a, a, in, a, a, in essence a chance to say where did he deliver, where did he not, and do we want to go back to some of those basics of what it's traditionally meant to be a Republican? Well, that's what fascinates me is that if you were to attack him on delivering, right, it would be about trade and it would be about immigration. But all you and many of the other Republican candidates or Republicans who are challenging the president are all coming at it from a very different angle. You're not attacking him for not fulfilling the, you know, make America great again promise. It's, it's based on debt. And I think that that's why 
there hasn't been as much of an enthusiasm for your candidacy. I mean, or any candidacy, sure. really. He has one of the highest popularities of a sitting president. How are you grappling? No, but no, yeah. wait, of a shrinking pie. Yeah. I remember when I got mm. elected governor, I went around to the sitting governors that were alive, and I said, look, I've never done this job before. You have. Give me some wisdom. And uh, bless his soul, Jim Edwards is now dead, but he said, you better start making friends right now. Politics is a game of addition, mm. not subtraction. Every decision you make, you're going to offend somebody. Start making friends now. It was great wisdom. I don't think Trump got that memo because if you look at, again, the, the Republican base, it's a shrinking pie, not a mm. growing pie. And if you look at the midterm congressional elections, what they showed was a trimmer, a precursor to, to troubles ahead given the way in which uh, suburban affluent districts turned against Trump. And so, well, that's the other question, which is whenever people hear, oh, you know, we can't attract to a shrinking pie, we have to go broad base, very much a 2012 message from the GOP, Big mm -hmm. Ten, right? Yeah. More immigration. It didn't work. I mean, the voters explicitly rejected that, and that's what I keep wanting to get no, back but, but to. But you're centering yeah. in on immigration. Which is also an economic issue. Sure, certainly. Yeah. But I don't disagree with the, the yeah. president on immigration. Mm -hmm. that, that's not a, a friction point. Mm -hmm. I mean, you pull my voting record sure, in the yeah. House, it's a very conservative voting record. There was concurrence on that front. I think we, we do need a secure border. Mm. But that doesn't absolve you from one results. So for all the banter that's gone back and forth, he hadn't gotten anything done. I mean, he certainly caused a lot of friction, a lot of, of, of smoke and fire, mm. but there's not been an additional mile of wall built. So you have a question on results, and then you have a question on broken promises with things that are core that are going to materially impact people's lives. This debt deficit government spending thing is going to blow up on people. Mm. We're living in the 1920s all over again, and we don't even realize it. And, and, and what followed the 1920s was a thing called the Great Depression. So if you were the president of the United States, would you build the wall? Oh, absolutely. Hmm. Again, not the whole. Yeah. You don't have to build it for the whole. I mean, it's such a, a, a overblown argument. I mean, you got about 700 miles of secure or quasi-secure border. You got about 1,300 miles of open border presently. And, you know, the last package, I think, was going to uh, add another 70 miles or so mm -hmm. of, of border slash wall. And so I say to my Republican friends, look, you realize this is not about closing the entire border. This is about another 70 miles. And I say to my Democratic friends, this is again overblown. This isn't about closing the entire border. This is about another 70 miles. So I think there's a lot of hyperbole on both sides of the debate. It's become, you know, sensationalized. I do think we need a secure border, though. Okay. So final question for you, sir. It seems that the people who are the most excited about your candidacy are basically media opposition figures to the president. Does that concern you at all? I think that that's yeah. incorrect. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe in fairness to you, yeah. you'd see it through the prism of media person. Sure. Uh, but that's not what I heard as I did this, kids were bankrupt and we didn't even know it, tour across uh -huh. the country. It was surprising to me the number of people you talk to in a small town diner and then come up and say, absolutely. Uh, I don't know that we can do another four years of this president or absolutely, I'm ready for the Republican Party to get back to its roots. And, and so I would just say that's not consistent with what I'm mm -hmm. hearing on the ground. Well, thank you so much for joining us, sir. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Absolutely. Yes, sir.